Thank you for joining us for what is clearly, as we've seen from headlines even this week, and there seems to be every week another headline about a mental health crisis either in the TV industry or, as we've seen this week, on screen. So great to have this discussion, but timely. Um, so my name is Caroline Frost. I am the TV chair of the Broadcast Press Guild and a freelance entertainment journalist, so I can talk about the instability of the geek economy and the effect it has on me, but nobody wants to hear about that. Um, so I've got a very um, celebrated panel with me tonight. I'll just go through very briefly introducing everybody and then we'll hear from them each in turn. Then we're going to have a slightly wide-ranging panel discussion and then Q&A from the floor. So do feel free to store up some questions and you will have your chance to throw them into the mix. So with me, first of all, so we start from my left. So we have Alex Pumphrey, who is the CEO of the Film and TV Charity. And Alex is launching something brand new in the next coming weeks or months. And we'll talk about the challenges that she is using as her priorities and what she proposes to do about them with her charity. We've got Richard Bentley, who has got a wonderful personal story of experience in the TV industry and how he has overcome them. Not going to steal your powder, but it's <laughs> definitely worth hearing. Very personal account. We've got um, Julia Lamb, who is the Media Engagements and Awards Manager of Mind, and who will be able to talk about exactly who's doing well in terms of representation on screen, and also some of the, the bigger challenges faced by the employees in the TV industry. Talking of awards, we have Holly, Holly Oaks, Exec Producer, Brian Kirkwood, who um, has been at the helm of Hollyoaks for 13 years. During that time, obviously, we've seen transformation of Hollyoaks into one of the prime time champions of mental health advocacy in all sorts of ways. So great to have you here. We've got Anna Williamson. We've split up the Hollyoaks duo so they can't gossip, but um, <laughs> we've got Anna Williamson in the middle, keeping order. Thorn. <laughs> you may recognise from Celebs Go Dating as resident psychologist or psychiatrist, sorry. Uh, a life coach, life coach. actually. All so right, therapist. If we're going to get picky now, Caroline, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and is has got all th sorts of things to say and is a proper advocate for mental health. And we have Jessica, who is a long-time familiar face of Hollyoaks and has been involved in some very significant stories. And am I right in thinking there's another Hollyoaks face here? I'm sorry. There We've we got go. two. Oh, got two. There we go. So do feel free to um, chip in as well when we get on to talk about screen representation. Thank you. Right. Um, first things first, I think we've got a clip which covers a few mental health issues, because obviously we know that this subject is something that's grown and has become increasingly broad, but this is just to give us a taste of the variety of challenges and solutions um, hopefully facing us. So can we just play our first clip, please, which I should say has been created by the Hollyoaks team, so we should thank them for that. It's like a dull whir that suddenly spins out of control. Well, it was like living in a bubble. It was like being in a dream, part of a film that you had no control over the storyline with. I think using the Snapchat filters was a really clever mechanic to demonstrate to people that often people with mental health problems do put that filter on their own mental health. And towards the end of the video, the filter was lifted. And that was the underlying message from each of the contributors, just open up and talk. I'm Bob Cryer. Nicole Barbalane. Ross Adams. Becky Frodsham. Helen McEwen. Laura Halligan. Lara McQueen. Tom Stokoe. Richard Linnell. And I don't filter feelings. There we go. All right, so let's start with Alex. So Alex, how long have you been with the charity, Alex? About 18 months. Right, so just about the same time as the Harvey Weinstein scandal cropped up. And yes. since then, we've had a huge number of different headlines. Yeah. Tell us about the biggest challenges facing you as the CEO of the TV and film charity and how, you, how you've decided to prioritise yeah. some of those solutions. There's lots, of, there's lots of opportunities, in truth. So we, as a charity, have been around for a very, very long time, but you may not have heard of us because we've kept a pretty low profile. So last year we relaunched as the film and television charity. And I think my colleagues very sneakily put a leaflet on all of your chairs, so we'll tell you a little bit more about us. We're here to support people who work in film and television, um, we launched the Film and TV support line last year, and this year we're doing bigger things around mental health, which is what I want to talk about. Before I do that, and I want to make three points about mental ill health in our sector. The first is that we ignore it. The second is that we enable it, and that we then legitimise it. So, 
The idea that we ignore it. We know that one in four people in the general population experience mental ill health every year, and one in six ex report experience a common mental health problem in any given week. You see lots about it in the media, particularly this week during Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, many of our organisations will have mental health strategies, might have mental health first aiders, and I think as you're going to hear much better than I can put it tonight, uh, we've now got some fantastic on-screen portrayals of mental health, and there's a growing body of evidence that shows the impact of that on society at large. Fantastic. What we haven't done is turn that gaze in on ourselves as an industry. We know nothing of the prevalence and nature of mental health within the TV sector. And actually, I was talking to, to Julia, who will come on to yesterday, and she said, I can't really find anything out about mental health in TV. And I said, no, it literally doesn't exist. Um, there have been studies done in Australia and Ireland, and if you can bear me being a bit of a stat head for a second, um, I'm going to tell you that in Australia, a study in 2016 found that in the general population, the incidence of moderate to severe anxiety was 4%. Within an industry sample, it was more than 10 times higher than that. It was 42%. The incidence of moderate to severe depression in the general population was 3%. In the industry sample, it was 17%, six times higher. Uh, the incidence of suicidal ideation in the last 12 months was 2%. In the industry sample, it was 19%. Those are, if those were true in the UK, those would be really alarming statistics. But we honestly don't know what the situation is. Mental health has been ignored as a serious issue for our industry for far too long. So the idea that we enable it, the outpouring of revelations in the wake of Weinstein that Caroline mentioned earlier, woke us all up to bullying, sexual harassment and bullying within our sector. And I think we all like to think the scales have fallen from our eyes and we've taken up arms to prevent anything like that from happening again. We've learned a lot about the effect of our industry's power structures on people and how it lends itself to bullying. What we haven't done is turn that into a proper examination of the mental health effects that come with it. And in the meantime, we know that we send people off to work very long hours, often away from home, to tight deadlines, in newsrooms where they're exposed to traumatic material, where they're in work one moment and out of it the next, never being able to commit to family and friends. Two thirds of the industry is freelance, uh, like Caroline, uh, where life can be exciting but precarious. Is that fair? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, you know, the phrase we hear time and time again is there is no HR department, you're on your own. There's rarely anywhere to turn to talk to without risk of being seen as difficult and jeopardising your next gig. So you keep your game face on and you shut up. So the third idea I want to mention is that we legitimise mental ill health. And I'm going to tell a little story of a chief executive of a very well-known production company, who I'm not going to name. He said to me when I was talking to him about mental health not long ago, uh, years back, someone asked me what the secret source of our business was, what the secret to our success was. And I said, we take mad people and turn them into money. I think there's a really pervasive idea within our sector that you have to be living life close at the edge to produce your most creative work. And that by allowing the trope of the mad creative genius to persist, I think we tacitly condone mental ill health as allowable or even worse, necessary for creative success. So what can we do? Well, I say that the time has come for the industry to grasp the nettle of its own mental health. I'm pleased to announce that the Film TV charity is launching a major new program of work to research and take action on mental health within the sector, which will start in June. Now, it's clear people love working television. It's a joy, it's a privilege, but it can also be tough. We know that. Those are the stories we hear every day as a charity. The stress, the strain, the toll it takes on bright and brilliant people. In early 2017, a location manager by the name of Michael Harm took his own life. Um, if you don't know Michael or of Michael and you've got your phone on you, please Google him, Michael Harm Location Manager. You'll see his face looking back at you. I didn't know Michael, but he's after, shortly before he died, he left messages for friends and colleagues saying that he hadn't felt supported by his own industry. That person approached us and that provided a catalyst for the launch of the film and TV support line that we introduced last April. It's so far taken over 2,000 calls and helped 1,000 people with matters emotional, practical, and financial. But this year, we want to go much deeper 
and understand what's really going on with the mental health in our sector. So we're launching this original piece of research in June, an industry wellbeing survey. So my request to you all today is please to follow us on Twitter at, at uh, Film TV Charity and complete the survey when it comes up because we really want to get a comprehensive picture of the state of mental health in our sector. And we're then convening an industry task force on mental health with the support of the Secretary of State, Margot James, uh, to steer and challenge that work and turn our findings into a practical plan. We want to work with industry to face into this issue and provide some powerful responses. Michael asked for the industry to do better. We want to work with the industry to rise to that challenge. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, well, that's a pretty encouraging start. I mean, I, the thing I do feel as though, as well, what you said is that the TV industry, from the, ex from the outside, when you meet people in the pub, in the, at, at parties, or if you work in TV, immediately people assume that you're in a limousine, just yeah. going between film sets yeah. and parties. And it's really interesting to, yeah. to go behind the curtain and hear some of those very personal challenges. So it's very comforting to know that this is now going on and being taken so seriously. So thank you very much. Um, which does bring us to Richard. So Richard, that will have rung some bells for you, I'm sure. Tell us about your experience moving from, I think you started out as a runner, yeah. and now you're running your own company, but it yeah. has not been smooth sailing. <laughs> so, over to you. So, uh, I'm Rich, I run a very small indie called Postcard, and the reason I run the business uh, is essentially completely due to an experience that I had as a freelancer in the industry. Uh, I think I'm in my 17th year of television work this year. And uh, since childhood, I'd always had OCD. It was my hilarious USP. Everyone thought it was very entertaining, uh, the number of weird and wonderful ticks I had. And um, I trundled through life with this slightly bizarre uh, condition that I didn't really understand. Uh, it sort of created a huge amount of anxiety that just lived under the surface that I think most people could probably pick up on, but I always sort of covered it up by just these odd quirks. And, uh, from working my way up, I've probably been in the industry about five years and I was an associate producer, I was working for a big indie in London and all of a sudden one day I woke up and my funny little ticks had changed. My intrusive thoughts that I could manage, the uh, compulsions that I experienced had flipped and had multiplied and I woke up in what I can only describe now as absolute crisis point. I was terrified. I was having intrusive thoughts about causing harm, I was having um, intrusive images, and I can remember vividly getting up at like four o'clock in the morning, Googling it, reading all of these personal testimonies of people, and then going in and starting my day at work. And in hindsight, it had been escalating for quite a few months previous. I was working on a really busy show. It was, um, it was a show that were, had lots of vulnerable young people, and I think that my responsibility towards them fed into it. And I ended up in a situation where I was really unwell and I was going to work every day, and I didn't take a minute off work. I went every day. I was pulling the extraordinaries that we were just talking about. And um, no one throughout this experience even asked if I was all right, and I think it would have been very obvious from my behavior that. I wasn't very well. Um, fast forward probably four or five weeks into this crisis point and I was pulled into a meeting room and uh, the head of the company who I'd never met before and uh, my direct boss sat me down and they said, Rich, something's happened. You've been here for over a year and we want old Rich back. We don't like new Rich was their exact words. We want old Rich back. We don't like new Rich. Uh, and I, I still didn't... I didn't feel safe enough to be able to disclose what was going on for me. I sort of apologized. I can remember getting quite teary. And um, I said I'd work on it. And that was my experience after working for them for a year. That was my experience of being able to go, you know, I'd worked in the industry for many years and I was absolutely fine. And um, following that, I went into therapy. I still worked. I should say that I never took a day to work all the way through this. Um, went to therapy, and when I got a bit better, I thought, I'm going to go and see if I can get a film about my experiences made. I'm going to make a documentary about it. And I went and pitched it to a big broadcaster that's not this one. <laughs> uh, and I was told that I was too well, and it's a shame I didn't come when I was sicker. And also, 
you're too middle class looking, so I don't think we'll get the ratings. And so from that point onwards, I decided that I would use the skills that I'd acquired in television to make films that have a social impact of some description. And we are now eight or so years later. It started as a hobby. I ran off my Blackberry in between jobs in telly, and now we've grown, and we only work on projects that have a good social purpose. We run impact campaigns off the back of it. So we made a film called The Stranger on the Bridge for Channel 4, and we ran a social media campaign off the back of that to raise awareness of mental health. That now is used in schools. We've got a schools workshop that goes into schools to use the sort of sparkliness of telly and the bit that we all love about it to engage young people in mental health. And as of this evening, we've, um, we've just opened our theatre production, which is cast and crewed completely with people with lived experiences of mental health. Uh, and I feel really damn proud that that's <laughs> what we're doing now, because everyone thought we were mad when we started. But we've survived and we've fended off. Uh, so yes, me. Well done. <laughs> um, we have a clip of Stranger on the Bridge. Yeah, I, think I think we, we do, do, don't we? So could you just, first of all, tell us a little bit quick, quickly about it, just as, your, as the intro? Yes. So basically, um, we had been making some short form content um, off our Blackberries for uh, mm -hmm. some mental health charities, including, including mine. And um, we knew that we wanted to make a film that was a broadcast film after I'd been told to get lost uh, at the broadcaster. And it took us ages, and um, it was just a complete coincidence that we bumped into this guy called Johnny Benjamin. He was a vlogger. He'd had a huge success online, and it was incredibly brave about talking about his own experiences of mental health. And I, we went to Bill's in Soho. We bought a huge jug of tea, and we sat for about five hours chatting to Johnny. And we were like, what was the pivot point in your life? Where did, where did things start to turn? And he said, it was just some guy. You know, I, I'd gone to Waterloo Bridge. I'd, I was intended to take my own life. And some guy just came along, and we were like, what did he say? Expecting him to be, say some amazing breakthrough thing. And he just said, you, you will get better. You will, you will, you will get better. And, and that was the first time through Johnny's experience of mental health. He was sort of 16, no, he was older than that. He was 20 at the time. That was the first time anyone had told him throughout the whole process that he would feel better and that this was just an illness and he was experiencing this in its moment. And so we, we asked Johnny if he'd sort of planned finding this guy and he said yes and we said right meet us here we'll go and we press record and we followed Johnny's search <laughs> for the good Samaritan that stopped him and right. that's what the clip is. Can we have the clip please? Just stopping just talking to me just giving me that time of day and just saying to me there's another way and, and it can get better honestly from that day like it, was, it restored my faith in humanity and um, I wouldn't be here if you didn't stop I think that's the most incredible thing is I'm trying to get my head around is that, you know, you, I'm, you know, it's nice to know that somehow I've made a difference. Yeah. Oh, you know, I mean. You've made an incredible, you know. Yeah, you made an incredible difference. Um, it must have been awful for you, mate. Um, you know, sounds like you've, and now, you know, you're, you're dealing with it, you know, it's a testament, you know. Yeah. Really proud of you. Oh. Thank you. There we go. Testament to one kind gesture. Thank you for that. Yeah, right. Um, let's move on to Julia. Julia works for Mind and specifically the media advisory service. So when producers, other TV organisations want to portray a mental health storyline or some other topic, Julia is a very significant point of contact. Tell us, Julia, what, what are the biggest sort of um, mistakes that TV makers make in portraying mental health and how do you help them overcome those mistakes and get it right? That's such an interesting question. Um, so I'm actually relatively new on the media advisory service. Um, I started four months ago. Um, so I'm just kind of like getting to grips with um, like some, of the, some of the ways in which we can support people to do the best representations of mental health problems on screen. Um, I think that um, 
the kind of the, the people that we have coming to us for advice range from like soaps, um, well, such as Hollyoaks, for example, and EastEnders, um, Coronation Street. There's a storyline out at the moment, um, Carl O'Connor, which we've worked on. Um, for example, it, it could be Holby City or Casualty, and we work on a huge range of different things. It can be a character that uh, whose story runs for you know years and years. In the case of EastEnders, or it can be a single episode um, where you've got someone coming into the, the Holby situation or the Casualty situation um, with a health problem that needs to be dealt with here and now so it is a huge range um, and that means that you get a huge range of starting points for the different kind of scripts that come into us um, so I, I would say there's le it's less about kind of mistakes and it's more about um, it's more about kind of understanding kind of how nuanced mental health problems are um, and you can start with kind of a really good um, idea but then actually trying to get that into the flesh to see how a character would think or feel or behave or how another character might interact with them. Um, and that's when kind of the trickery comes with how you should portray mental health um, and how you should portray kind of uh, the best and the worst and how that comes, comes together as a journey. Um, so I think it's less about mistakes and it's more about starting points and how much you know when you start on that journey. Um, so I think one of the things that we're always keen to do with a long-standing character, for example, um, is to think about what developing a mental health problem means for them. Um, obviously, mental health is a, is a no, not a sort of one-size-fits-all. You can't just get a diagnosis and that'll dictate how you'll think or feel or behave for X amount of time. Um, you will experience it in your own individual way. So when we look at characters, it's not just sort of, you know, what does depression look like? It's what does depression look like for someone in the Archers? What does it look like for someone in Hollyoaks? What does it look like for the audience that's watching that as well mm -hmm. and trying to bring that to life? Fantastic. And um, how do you then get that right? What, where do you go and how do you bring those, those different components together so that your program makers get it right? What do you give them? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a mixture, really, because uh, everyone has a different way that they want to try and develop a story. Mm -hmm. um, so we might start off with just a shell um, of, you know, if, if it, for example, it's a, a one-off drama that's being developed, we might start off with a shell of a character and an outline of what the plot's like. And our feedback could be, well, you can't get from there to there without this. Right. Um, so some of it can literally be kind of just advising on that story arc. Um, and in sort of more involved examples, um, so if we take the example of Carla on Coronation Street, um, a really kind of strong script here, um, but we actually provided um, a case study who could talk about her own experience of psychosis, who could talk to the production team and also talk to the actress, um, Ali King, about um, her experience of psychosis. And, and she'd, not similar circumstances, but sort of almost a similar diagnosis. She'd had a trauma in her life that had led to psychosis that had come out of the blue for her. Mm -hmm. And it was a woman of a similar age to the character, and we felt that they could relate really well to each other. So anything from kind of like that story arc to actually saying, here's someone to talk to, it's a safe space, you could ask whatever you like, and then work out how to portray that character mm -hmm. on screen. And what's really satisfying is often you see these same actors and actresses then become very powerful advocates for some of these, these issues that wouldn't see normally get such a, a public stage. And because these actors and actresses are, are stepping up, and I think that that takes the thing full circle, doesn't it? Um, so, Brian, let's, let's talk to you. 13 years at the helm of Hollyoaks. During that time, Hollyoaks has quite rightly been celebrated and respected in the industry for its portrayal of mental health issues. I would say arguably over the other soaps. I mean, <laughs> no bias. But um, tell us about how that change has come about and how you do make sure that you get these things right. OK, well, um, thank you for the kind words. We take it very seriously. Um, it goes back to my childhood. Um, I've spoken before about the fact my mum took her own life when I was seven. Uh, I later lost my dad to addiction. So mental health had a huge impact. It defined mm. mental ill health, defined my family and my childhood. Um, but more than the mental ill health, it was the silence that, that crippled us. Nobody ever spoke about it, ever. And I recently spoke to my auntie Jean about it, and uh, I felt like I was thrown her under the bus, really, but she just said we didn't know how to. We didn't know how to approach these subjects. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone, I mean, now I'm in my 40s, and I think my brother and I are still reeling from it, really. Um, so fast forward to the job I'm doing on Hollyoaks, and I take 
it very seriously the responsibility to help people start a really difficult conversation. Um, I think it makes an enormous difference if something is on in your living room at 6.30 or you're having your dinner on your lap and it can open up a conversation that you otherwise wouldn't have had. And not just if you're going through it with your parent, um, but the parent with a child or any, any different combination of that. So um, that's why I think we've found such success with our mental health stories over the last couple of years because they've really sort of hit a nerve. Um, and we've told some, we've told many, many uh, important kind of era-defining stories of the last year or two, um, including Lily's self-harm, played by Lauren McQueen. And we took the very bold decision. So Lily, Lily has been struggling with self-harm for about two years. Um, a very meticulously researched story. It went into the terrifying um, territory of group self-harm which is something that I haven't even mm. heard of, Stop. but is um, happening in every school uh, in the UK. Really? Um, if you talk to any 13-year-old, uh, they'll tell you that it's happening in their school. Um, and there's this epidemic of mental health that's happening to young people. So Lily uh, was coming to the end of her story, and we actually took a bit deep breath and thought it would be the right thing for Lily to lose her life as a result of her struggle. We've shown some very, very triumphant um, uh, success stories with our mental health story. We've had Scott um, overcome his depression. We've had... Um, uh, Cleo overcome or living successfully with her bulimia uh, and Alfie, um, Alfie Nightingale living successfully with his schizoaffective disorder. Having told these success stories, we thought it was important to show that yeah. sometimes people lose that battle. Um, and I was uh, mindful of Zamo in Grange Hill yeah. when I was a kid and how that stopped traffic yeah. when Zamo... Nancy Reagan knew it, who Zamo exactly. was. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I just thought we have an opportunity to do something as profound and impactful with Lily's, with Lily's death. And it went out two weeks ago. And, and I think we should be proud of it because it was meaningful, it was important, it was not mm -hmm. sensational. Uh, we didn't romanticise it. And I think that's one of the things that we, we, we work hard to get right. It's making sure there's no sort of vampiric kind of romantic quality in our storytelling. We are not... Mm -hmm. We are not suggesting to any vulnerable teenagers, this is the way to get your mum's attention, this is the way to get your boyfriend. We work really closely with MIND Goodness. to make sure that we take that responsibility. Um, what happens uh, in terms of reception to those storylines? Do you find that audiences stay? Do they switch off, but you do it anyway because it's important? Far from it. Um, the feedback we get is that our, when Hollyoaks goes super serious, mm. that's when more people watch and we have more viewer interaction than on anything else we do. Right, so it's, it's reaching people, as it you really say, is, yeah. 6.30 in their living rooms. Fantastic. Um, I think we have a clip from you as well. So anything you need to say about the clip or will it speak for itself? What's the clip? <laughs> <laughs> It'll speak for itself. <laughs> Can we have run the Hollyoaks clip, please? This year, Hollyoaks uh, tackled quite a few mental health storylines, such as Lily's self-harm, Alfie's schizoaffective disorder, Cleo's bulimia, and of course, Scott's suicide attempt. Get out of me house, Scott. We don't want you, Scott. The reason I'm so proud of the Hollyoaks digital team is that they create these amazing campaigns that work so well uh, with our storylines. Samaritans thought that the Don't Feel to Feelings campaign was a really important message to get out there, particularly to young people. We wanted to show how having bulimia or having an eating disorder is a serious mental health problem. So on our Hollyoaks Instagram, through Instagram stories, we use people from the charity Beat, charity ambassadors who've suffered from eating disorders, and they shared their stories and their everyday life and how they cope with maybe certain triggers. Personally, I thought I would never get a passion back for sport because it was something I always loved before I got ill. But now, after recovery, I'm back in the gym. We built a Facebook Live studio to bring other charities onto set to talk about mental health. We'd been working very closely with Mind and Johnny Benjamin and Alfie's story. So we created a Facebook Live where Richard Linnell interviewed both and took questions from the audience. What would be the one piece of advice that you would give to someone going through the same thing? All sorts of things around self-care as well, things mm. that you can do to build up your own resilience. I think that's really important. Ultimately, it's talk. It's talk. It's talk, yeah. really. It's talk and open up. 
and know that you're not alone. There we go. Thank you, Brian. And right, we'll move on to Anna, is life coach and uh, one of the faces of Celebs Go Dating. Um, Anna, obviously, we've had a few headlines just in the last year. I mean, mm. some, some tragic headlines that have come along with reality TV. Um, could you just talk a little bit about, um, I guess, some of the difficulties of on-screen talent and the, the difficulties they face and how... Um, somebody like yourself is charged with looking after that as, as best you can, while let's also face... I mean, one of the questions I've been asked here is, should people with mental health stay away and stick to a less challenging sector? I'm sure the answer <laughs> to that is no, but please unpack that for us. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to find where to start, really, with it, and kick me, Brian, because I go on. Um, I, I'm in my 20th year of being in telly, and I started out uh, in kids' telly for 10 years, and um, I've been banging the drum for mental health for the last 13, alongside the Alliance of, uh, of Mind. Uh, banging the drum for mental health before really anyone knew what it was. Um, and that's because... Um, as on-screen talent initially, before I became a therapist behind the scenes as well, and it all came crashing together on screen with my new job as the new agent on Celebs Go Dating. Um, 13 years ago, I was uh, fronting uh, a number one kids TV show called Toonatic for GMTV up at uh, Tower at South Bank. And uh, my story sort of feeds in a little bit to Rich's experiences. Um, I was a 25-year-old um, uh, young presenter, um, as in working in the industry, but I was experiencing a lot of struggles in my private private life at the time. I was working in an industry, which we all are, where uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Classic people pleaser. Um, I felt like I needed to be at the top of my game because everyone around me kept reminding me I needed to be at the top of my game because, hey, guess what, Missy? There's a thousand other applicants behind you that are going to steal your job the minute that you are remotely crap at it or show a sign of weakness. Then you throw into the mix real life, okay? I was in a bad relationship. I was in an abusive relationship. Didn't tell anybody. I put this pressure on myself. I worked within a team of 35. Uh, we were freelancers, and there you go. Wow, I'm on a three-month rolling contract. No one's going to give me a full-time contract because it's just not how TV works. Oh, I've got a mortgage to pay. OK, now I'm starting to feel quite stressed. Cut a very long story short, I wrote a book about it called Breaking Mad. Um, <laughs> I ended up having a, a mental health breakdown. Um, at work, and I document it um, very honestly and openly um, in, in my book, and I have done it many times on the telly as well, um, when uh, I'd gone... Uh, I'd, mental health feeds into so many areas, OK? In a nutshell, I was diagnosed, and I've been managing generalised anxiety disorder and depression, GAD and depression, and panic disorders ever since. And I've managed it really well. And um, I'm really passionate about approving uh, and showing people that, guess what, hey... You can work with a mental health issue. You are okay, you are reliable, just as anybody else. You're just a bit different sometimes, but hey, everyone's got their quirks, haven't they? Um, but for me, I hadn't slept for days, weeks. Um, the, the amount of stress and pressure and... Uh, Crucially, as Rich, I think, had touched on, I, I put that mask on. I hadn't told anyone. I'd battled on. Everyone wants to see that game face day in, day out. It's the autumn quarter. No one takes time off. Crap, I need time off. I'm struggling. Nope, no one's having that time off. Didn't dare ask. And that was my mistake within this industry. I didn't trust my bosses enough to tell them I really was struggling and I really needed some time off. So what are they going to do? What are they supposed to do? If you're not giving them that hint, what are they supposed to do with that? They're not going to tell you. They're not going to read your mind. We're all busy, aren't we? Anyway, um, I came into work and the, the unthinkable uh, happened to me. Um, no one likes to have a breakdown in front of your colleagues, but I did. GMTV had just come off air, Lorraine was off air, we were going through set change transition. Uh, it took a nice colleague, takes one to no one, who'd just come back from six months off with depression. She saw the look in my face that said, that girl's not right. She said, are you OK? And the floodgates opened. All very embarrassing, snot-fest mess on the floor of Studio 5 and GMTV. Um, but that was the best thing that ever happened. Happened because, hey, guess what? My bosses were absolutely great. Why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us something was wrong with you? So my experience is in a very long-winded way, Caroline. Um, I now, fast forward 13 years, it became very apparent to me, and I think it's important because we are all in this industry. When I came back to work at GMTV, I had a particular male colleague of mine 
doesn't matter if it was male, actually. It could have been female. Um, and I was very open about what had happened to me, that I was on uh, anti-anxiety medication and I'd been in therapy with a psychiatrist. And I came back to work feeling absolutely raring to go. Therapy was brilliant. It's not a dirty word. Americans all do it. We should all do it. It was great. Um, and he said to me, he went, always remember it. Mm, I wouldn't have admitted that if I were you. You're probably going to get fired. Shows weakness. And I remember thinking, it was either sink or swim moment. I remember thinking, screw you, screw you. I have literally faced suicide for a split second three weeks ago to coming back and to smashing the ratings again. And actually, I had the best two years left on that show afterwards. And I thought, Do you know what? This has got to change. And I did an article um, for the Mail, and uh, I decided to talk openly about it. I'm a bit rebe rebellious, I guess. And... Uh, I was amazed by, this was just the ITV at the time, my inbox suddenly went pink, you know, the hashtag everyone email that was going around the whole tower at the time. I must have had 50 emails, everyone from CEO level right down to runner, within the space of a day when that article went out on the internet. With everyone literally, a dirty little secret, where did you get help? I'm struggling, I can't cope. Occupational health was bursting at the seams with runners and researchers stressed to their eyeballs that were overperforming and couldn't cope. Um, so I'm very passionate about behind the scenes mm. and in front of the camera um, about everyone just getting the right awareness and the right help and that actually to have a mental health is like an issue such as Rich knows and I know. It's actually, in my circumstance, has actually been a huge strength of mine. So interesting. I was just thinking how a few years ago, I mean, it's completely a, a tiny insignificant story, but no. I had thyroid surgery, this radioactive thing, and it's one of those things where until you happen to mention it and you suddenly realise how many people that you've yeah. met who've never mentioned, oh, oh, I know somebody who had that. And nobody had ever mentioned it. And so it's like seeing estate agent signs when you're mm. looking for a house. And the same thing happens. All of these people crawl out of the woodwork and you just realise how many groups there are of yeah. people who could have had those conversations five years ago and were suffering in silence on their own. So it just takes somebody like you, the, the meerkat mm. with the head above the parapet, so. So, well done. Yeah. Um, but obviously, more people are now coming forward, like Richard, like yourself. Um, so, Jessica, but I'm thinking as well about the game face requirement, mm. because you are a familiar face in people's rooms, living rooms, every evening. They must think they know you when they meet you. You, you must have this extra requirement to be game oh. on a lot of the time. How do you balance that with your own personal needs? That's absolutely true. I started working professionally when I was seven. So I've been in this industry my entire life. I don't know how to do anything else. Um, and when I joined Hollyoaks nearly 15 years ago, I think it is now, um, I would go out and I would be looking at people and they'd be looking at me and I'd be going in shops and checking. Have I got something on my face? You know, what is it, what is it? And the paranoia of that is, is, is quite weird. And something that nobody talks about, no one talks about the fact that you never get a day off. I remember years ago, I had an ex-boyfriend that was really, really poorly, and he was in ICU, and uh, I was sat outside crying, and someone said, can I get a picture with you? And I said, um, do, do you mind if I don't? And, uh, excuse my language, but as they walked away, they went, fucking bitch. And I thought, great, there's never a chance, is there? There isn't actually never an opportunity to be off. And that's something that I can talk about, having, having worked in a high-pressure environment like Hollyoaks. And it is, it's mental, it's amazing, but it is crazy. We have no time to call our own. We are on call for that show five days a week. If someone calls in sick or it rains, we've got to come in and we've got to perform. So it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day. It doesn't matter if you're tired or you're sick or whatever. You've got to be there and you've got to know your lines and you've got to turn out an amazing performance. And that's a really, really tall order to ask cast and ask a lot of young people actually to do. Um, and that's something that I think is really worth talking about. It's incredibly difficult for freelancers to do short contracts and it's incredibly intense and you've got the panic of where's the next job? How am I going to pay that rent? But what do you do when you're in a long-term drama and you've got to keep this going year on year on year and turning out fresh and being in that building and being happy and good and giving the performance that you know that your audience and your, your boss deserves. Um, so, yeah, it's mad. It's a mad job. Have you ever felt... I mean, there's, it's, it's a spectrum, and I'm sure we'll get mm. to this, of, as you say, a stressed-out day, at mm. what point it becomes 
something approaching a more serious mental health issue because we've all had a bad day and we've been told by our parents, my mum used to say, go and do a press up, just the one, so that was going to mend everything. <laughs> but had, have you ever felt that you are in sort of approaching anything or do you know, do you recognise the signs now if somebody is demanding too much of you? What, what are your methods for I think I'm incredibly privileged. I have an incredible support network at home. My right. mum is my first port of call for everything so if I didn't have her and amazing friends I think I would really struggle and I know that a lot of my colleagues not a lot but some of my colleagues have struggled with that in the past and being able to switch off particularly when you do really challenging upsetting hard-hitting storylines being able to say well that's work and this is this is me now mm -hmm. is quite a weird psychological thing that we ask actors to do which is why I think so many actors are vulnerable to mental health problems because we have to put our head spaces in these weird, challenging, un, sometimes very difficult places in order to create a great performance. Um, and giving people the tools and saying, like at Lyme, we have now, you know, mental health support. Um, so they can help people and give them information and say, do you want to just come and talk? Do you need that quiet space? We've got that. Do you want to come and do yoga? That's all there for people, which is incredible and mm. wasn't there when I first started working there, which is an amazing step forward. And with the cast, we now have like a, we have our cast reps, of which I am, I am one. And um, we encourage people, come and talk to me. Is it, about, is it about what you've done today? Is it about maybe that scene didn't quite go as well as you'd hoped or you fluffed your lines or the director moved on because we were out of time and we had to buy that take or it was raining or it was freezing cold and I couldn't concentrate, you know. All those things, we try and talk to people about it or say, not even about work, about bills and, and paying a tax, and no one tells actors that. Here's a bunch of money, and a year later, we're going to ask for half it back. <laughs> like, it's really unfair. And so Hollyoaks and Lyme have now tried to, to help people with this, to give people information and say, ask a question. What's the dialogue? No one's going to judge you. We just want to help, and that's why I've been there nearly 15 years and very proud yeah. to be there. Sounds like a great place to work. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, I think, for the rest of the industry as well, in terms of that instability and how do you balance everything. Um, Alex, let's come to you, back to you. I am really interested because I think one of the things that always gets thrown around, especially, as you say, it looks so glamorous and people would say, well, a soap star really has nothing much to complain about in the scheme of things. These are pointy end of the plane problems in comparison with other struggles people have. How do you know when people from the apparently quite glamorous TV industry come to you, whether they are just having a moan or whether there is something more serious afoot? How, how can you recognise the signs of something that does need attention? I think, I think you're absolutely right in that many people have that sense that they're in a privileged position and mm. their friends will be reinforcing that often. Mm -hmm. And we hear people say, well, I go down the pub and I can't tell my mates that I'm having a real rough time because you're the one who's working in the TV industry and it's all sexy and glamorous. Mm -hmm. So if there's a stigma around mental health, I think it can be even greater for people working within the sector. I mean, we hear, I mean, we hear about loads of stuff. We hear about lots of the things that have been talked about on the panel. I think um, uh, all the way through people's career stages from the very youngest people and from the sector where it's often about establishing yourself and your reputation and you don't know how the system all works and you don't understand how to do the tax and all that stuff um, that no one's explained to you. I think one thing that particularly impacts there is financial anxiety. That's something we mm -hmm. haven't really touched on. Um, you know, some of those starting jobs are not fantastically well paid. Mm -hmm. and You're lucky to be here is always the implicit message. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we hear a lot of, I mean, I hear people saying, well, I've got this job, but I don't know how I'm going to afford the transport to get to mm -hmm. set every day because I've got to be there at six in the morning to help set up and public transport's not running. And how do I, you know, how do I mm -hmm. pay, get enough money on my Oyster card to get there? So I think financial anxiety, particularly amongst young people, is, is definitely one we hear a lot of. Um, I mean, you know, we're not here to judge and categorise people's worries. And one thing we're really keen to do, certainly with the support line, is to say we're here for problems big or small. Right. You know, we're, so practical if you as much to, as anything. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you've come off set and it's 
been a really long day and it's one in the morning and you're driving home and you've had a shitty day and someone's yelled at you and you want to talk to someone, that's fine. You can mm -hmm. call us up and you can have that conversation. Um, you can call us up if it's crisis points. Um, you can call us up if it's something really, really practical or if it's financial help you need. And right. we do help people who've got into financial difficulty. Um, so we, you know, we're trying to, to provide that, that full breadth support. Um, and I think we hear... You know, I, think, I feel like we hear the stories that the industry doesn't hear yeah. <laughs> because they can't be talked about to the industry for the reasons we've said. You know, you have to keep it to yourself. You've got what's to keep what's your the most on. common complaint? If we're going to just grab one tonight that off the top of your head, sorry to put you on the spot. Right in the time, top trumps. Of, top trumps, yes. Uh, industry issues. Um, I mean, we, we know about the instability of the industry. Is it, is it that? Is it the financial? I think the... The knock-on of that. Um, the most widespread, perhaps not the most serious thing, but I think the most widespread thing you hear is that overwhelming sense of isolation and loneliness, which is ironic mm. when we're quite a social industry in many ways. That praises the extroverts, and perhaps. So you have these yeah. times when you're on set and it's all very social and it's mating and you've got all your friends around you and perhaps you're all having drinks after work. But next week, you're sitting mm. in your flat on your own wondering where the next job's coming from. And that... Right. Up and down is really hard to deal with, and people, even in quite social environments, can feel very isolated and lonely and unsupported. So th one thing I'm really interested in us being able to do as a charity is create more of a sense of belonging for the people of the industry. You know, this is mm -hmm. somewhere you should feel you belong and where you have somewhere to turn to. And that sounds a bit soft and soppy, perhaps, mm -hmm. but I think that small thing can make a big difference for mm. a large number of people. And as we've seen in Richard's film, the, the significant potential of a, of a single gesture things will get better. Um, Anna, can I come back to you for what you touched on earlier where your colleague said that wasn't a good look. Do you think it wasn't a good decision, we're yeah. still in that era where, or do you think we've, turned, we've made a handbrake turn and because of conversations like this, because of storylines mm. where, I mean, I, I, I was working in an Australian tabloid newsroom where you can imagine that mental health wasn't exactly at the top of mm. the deck. Um, but, I, I mean, I had a colleague who had been secretly diagnosed with bipolar. I doubt she's told them now. But do you, do you feel that it can break a reputation if you are seen as we're not fragile? We're not there yet. And I know, obviously, Julia, you know, we work together at Minds a lot. Um, I do think it still takes... Um, a lot of guts to, to openly admit it. Um, I do think we have definitely made some massive headway in the last few years. Um, people like Prince Harry speaking very openly about his mental health. I, mean, I can't what, what the line is, Julia, but I, he did more for mental health in that one admission. Um, you know, we've been campaigning for 10 years or so. Um, but I think it... I, <sighs> When we stop talking about this, it's because it won't be a thing anymore. And I think, I think that's the thing. We are still talking about it because there's still an awful lot of work that needs to be done. And I think the big part of it is non-judgmental. It's absolutely key. I'm a counsellor now myself. And it's just to humanise it and recognise. And as you pointed out when I said to you, the minute you say something that you've been experiencing, you probably had it rich as well, suddenly you get the, oh, well, yes, that me, or my friend, or my uncle, or my cat, you know. We've all got, we can hear now, we've all, you know, got something in common. And I think we just need to just be really real about it. But mm. I think we are still a way off because, yeah, I, if I'm completely honest, every time I have got, I mean, it's out there very publicly now, you know, but and I'm, and I'm absolutely fine with it. Um, but yeah, of course, you do think, I'm sure there's someone out there thinking, oh, she's admitted she's got anxiety. Is yeah. she now going, we've got, um, we're just about to start the next series of Celebs Go Dating, you know, and you, mm. I don't actually worry about it. But, um, but interestingly as well, I think the level, my experiences of the level of duty of care that have been in the industry as well have been exemplary. And I'm not just flying the flag for Lyme, but obviously Lyme makes celebs as well. But the mm. level of care that is available um, to all of us is absolutely exemplary. And I think that's key. It's normal. Normalizing it. Everyone that works on the show has a chat with the psych um, and has constant support available. And I think that's what's key, whether you're cast or crew, I think that's key because you're all part of the same club. But is that the norm or do you feel that this is quite um, hallowed turf that you're I, describing? I've been quite amazed in 20 years of telly, this for me seems to have Wow, yeah, there does seem to be a real norm norm about it in a really refreshing way. Right. And I'm hoping that other 
channels and production companies See the benefits. are going. Yeah, because you do, because there's retention. Uh, it's mm. a lot of it's about self-esteem and security. In an industry where it's full of insecurity, we just need to feel secure. And even if that's just because we understand and get each other, that's, that's definitely a step in the right direction. Something we've adopted on um, Hollyoaks as well recently, the, the psychological um, chats, mm. particularly for young artists. We, yeah. we ask a lot of our young artists and uh, we told a storyline about um, sexual abuse in this football arena last mm -hmm. year. And, uh, and we took great effort to make sure that the young artists involved in that were, had um, the ability to talk to people before, during and after with direct contact to a producer throughout, because it's, as, as Jess was saying, it's a lot to ask. And, and I'll, everything that's going on backstage that we've talked about, but I also, I think if you're on the telly, the assumption is, as you said, that you're swatting around in mm. a limousine, but actually you're giving your whole self the whole time. And that's a lot to ask of a young person who hasn't got the, the who hasn't learned how to deal with that. Sure, I mean, Jessica, you're a young person on set. Um, have you ever had a storyline, for example, or a working day experience that has caused you angst, that's made you want to go and speak to somebody like Richard or one of these people? Oh, God, probably these people? loads. <laughs> right. <laughs> to be honest, like, yeah. I, I remember years ago we were doing a um, miscarriage storyline. My character had a, had a right. miscarriage. And um, the script was written by an incredible writer, Alana Hallam, who had had a miscarriage. And she wrote this incredibly brutal, raw script, and it was beautiful. And I wanted to do it justice as much, you know, as an egotistical actor myself, mm. as for her and for anybody else. And I remember coming back and, and there'd been a complaint that it was too much. It was too big, it was too raw, it was too real. And they, Sorry, they from who? From, from Ofcom or whoever it right. was, like, beforehand. And, um, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, but it might have been before your time, I'm not sure. Um, and they said, we have to reshoot it and we have to dial it down. And I went home and I cried and I cried and I cried and I rang my mother and I said, well, what, what do you do? You know, and, and that's been one of many days. There's been days where I've cried because I went on holiday for two weeks and I ate all the food in Mexico and now I can't fit in any of the new costumes they bought me. <laughs> <laughs> so I cried about that and that's like a week ago. Um, actors are emotional people. It's, it's, it's what you ask of us. Um, but it's being, as you said, to recognise something and say, well, that is that because I'm, I'm tired, probably mm. a bit jet-lagged and hungry because I haven't eaten for two, 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> and, or is it because that's an issue mm. and something that I need to delve a bit deeper into? And I think, personally, the only time I've ever come close, and I, I thank my lucky stars that I'm not somebody that experiences problems with my mental health, but I do know an awful lot of people that do, um, and <clears throat> um, is that is being able to recognise it and say, mm. is this me? throwing my toys out of the pram or having a bad day or mm. just a bit tired, a bit stressed, you know, mm. is this something that's going to pass or is this something that I need to deal with and work out why I feel like this? What is it that's mm. making me react in this way? And then seeking the appropriate help with that. And it's full circle, isn't it? Because we see so many more storylines, so we've got these points of reference that we mm. didn't used to have. Um, Richard, as well as it clearly being the right thing to do, what are the benefits to you of running a production company where this is such a priority? I mean, in terms of your working day, in terms of profit making, I mean, what, what has come your way as a result of making those changes in terms of your focus? Yeah, so um, I, don't, I don't know, for a job, you know, on the coal face of bringing the work in, our job is to make sure that we go out and we're pitching programmes that are at the forefront of British society and are stepping forward. And so, the idea that you would exclude people onto your workforce because of anything mm. seems completely bonkers because we need as much diversity in the industry as physically possible so that we can make diverse programming. And if we've all stepped out of our houses in South London and walked the same route to work, we're not gonna have any, any, any sort of breadth to the programs that we're making. So we are probably the absolute polar end. We're a small employer. I, uh, I'm, I, it's me and a small group of people. So <coughs> it, 
we don't struggle with the management issues that you might have in a larger organization, but we essentially welcome diversity of all natures, and I hope that we create a safe enough space and share enough of our own experiences and enough of us, we're not robots, that I would be um, really sad if someone ever came up to me and said that they weren't able to talk to me about a struggle or a bad day or anything, however big or small. So, so obviously that it is the right thing to do. I'm just wondering about the the sort of the bottom line benefit in terms of if you're just being completely kind of commercial and ruthless okay. about it how you keep your your company going as well as attending to all of those things yeah does so it help it yeah absolutely yeah right. because okay. we, do, we don't we uh, we have very low sickness in our in right our, so that's a, a clear yeah totally benefit. Yeah, absolutely and mm -hmm. everybody is empowered by what they do and give uh, yeah we just we're, yeah I, I think I think across the board if you look at it on all levels including the financial front it's beneficial there's no right. argument about it right so it's just surprising it's taken so long for the bean counters to catch up with the likes of you chaps I, I think that's fear driven I think right. that um we are a strange industry in the sense that there's not a huge amount of um of training when you're coming up through the ranks. I think that when teams are put together, they're often made up of freelancers working on a project with a really tight schedule. Therefore, they're all new faces to one another. And mm -hmm. the industry's got lots of challenges. And It probably sounds more challenging than it actually is in practice as well to make those changes. As you say, it, it amounts to taking some, making somebody a cup of tea. It's something so basic. And yet, if you, if you walk, to walk into an organization and say, right, today's the day we implement time to change and everyone thinks oh here we go yeah. one of Greg Dyke's sort of squeezy toys um Brian how do you balance getting the show to wear with all of these other concerns when you've got the creative emotional types who might suddenly burst into tears because they need a shoehorn to get the dress on and all the other things how do you <laughs> keep it we'll never live that down now no, that's, that's all I remember from today how do you how do you balance um in terms of working at Lyme we're very, very lucky to be led by uh, right. Kate Little and Claire Poiser, who run it with integrity and kindness. Mm -hmm. And that makes such a difference. And we've all got ex experiences of working places that aren't run with integrity and kindness. And it's fucking horrible uh, mm -hmm. when you're in that environment and you've got the pressure to, to deliver. Um, mm -hmm. So I think... On a personal level, it's about making sure, try working as hard as we can to make sure that people don't, aren't exposed to that kind of behaviour, that kind of work ethic. Um, and, you know, we've put things into practice. We have a quiet room. Since we signed the Time to Change um, uh, pledge last year, we've got a quiet room. We've got uh, mental health um, officers throughout the building. We've done a lot of work making sure we had a big event, making sure that people knew about it and it wasn't just on a pamphlet somewhere upstairs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we made sure that everyone is involved on and off screen. So on a, but on a day to day basis, I mean, that sounds great in theory when we're sitting here talking about it. But when literally the clock is ticking, the time's running out, the light's going, all of the things that you as an exec, mm. you have commercial deadlines, priorities, as well as all of those things. How do you balance them? How do you, where, where, is it just training? Where have you got that from, that ability to keep that to the fore? Oh, I think being in Liverpool helps. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, genuinely, I think we've got kind of a, we're lucky enough to have a bit of a village mentality where in Lyme in right. particularly. Um, so you've got a real team. It really mentality. is. Yeah. And, and that's such a hideous cliche, one big happy family, because so often it's not. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if an artist or a crew member is having a really bad day because something terrible is happening right. in their life, then we'll know about it, we'll talk to them. Um, we'll hopefully try and help them make it better. Mm. Of course. Hi guys, sorry, hi. <laughs> so uh, my name's Rachel, I'm also in the show of Hollyoaks and um, I had a baby about two years ago, mm -hmm. so she'll nearly be two now and I remember going back to work after six months and really being stressed out about that because I wasn't sure how that was going to be but I have to thank Hollyoaks and Lime for being so incredible and actually telling me that if you need to take time out, you can mm. do that. But also returning to work was incredible because I would be on set 
and have leaky boobs because mm-hmm. I was, it was time to feed and they'd let me go off and feed my child. I had a room that I could breastfeed in. I had a room that I could pump in. And I think things like that for an actress, especially because when I fell pregnant, I was quite scared and wasn't sure how that was going to work out. Would I, would I still be able to continue in my career? But having Lyme support me made me feel really relaxed and welcomed. And I think that's what helped in terms okay. of mental health because after a baby, it's not easy, yeah. <laughs> trust me. But, um, but so not only for the cast people who might have other problems, I think for motherhood as well, I think that was absolutely fantastic that I had that wow. support, so thank there you. There we go. <laughs> so, there you go. You've got that and to that, with, to, with Brian, it's on stating the obvious, but it, essentially, it's when you're saying, you know, when you get your deadlines, the crisis point, mm. you know, when you, you know, the, the shit hits the fan, it's prevention, um, it's early intervention. And I know it sounds really obvious, but but that's what you're doing. And obviously, there are going to be scenarios and situations, of course, when you might be having a bad day because you haven't slept for five years. I know exactly how that feels <laughs> as well. I'm a two-year-old. Um, and the industry's really supported me as well. But it's just, it's just ha- that level of understanding and preventing any mental health issues becoming mental health issues. You know, managing low mood, low levels of stress, worries. It's just normal human emotions. And if you catch them and give the facilities and have the procedures in place to actually catch that and say, you're just having a crap day. You know, life happens to people. You're going to have off weeks. You know what? This is what we've got in place. Yoga, a quiet room, and this or that. And if you really need to, you can go home. Mm. That will hopefully stop anything escalating and just that low-level hum starting to escalate over a period of weeks and months when we get to the bang crisis point and that person then does have a label and a mental health condition. Mm. I now know with mine, I didn't even need to get to a breakdown phase. If over a period of 10 months, I knew how to cope, I knew how to talk, and if I had um, the relevant situations and, and procedures in place for me to be able to go and chill. And I think that's what's key for all of these um, companies and production companies, exactly what you're doing, is put those strategies in place. Make the message very loud and clear, and then hopefully it'll only be a, only a, a much smaller percent of people that really, really do get to that crisis point. Yeah, yeah. headed off at the pass. I've got one more question for Julia, and then I'll throw it to the floor. Julia, I'm just, this is all very well for this team, the village of Liverpool <laughs> and Hollyoaks and Lyme, but what about these bigger companies? I mean, we're, we're in one today where people perhaps aren't so intimately involved with each other and much more perhaps the feeling of being a, a small piece of a massive jigsaw. How can you still implement these same motivations? Yeah. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say, my mum used to say that about the press up as well. And I'm just wondering if we're distantly related. <laughs> <laughs> just a thing. Very, very strange moment for me when I heard that. It's like, Maybe it works. Just takes me right back. Yeah. Um, so I think that... Um, there is just some really common principles to good workplace well-being um, and I think we've heard some of them already here today from Brian and from Anna and actually it, it is starting with a culture where you can be open and you can talk mm. and obviously it's fine for me to sit here and say that from an employer that obviously prioritises mental health well and well-being above almost anything else um, but I would say that in organisations where actually you feel like you can't speak out and there is pressure to always be on show and always be on on your best performance. It it does feel like a bit of a prisoner's dilemma. No one can talk because no one is talking and it can be very hard to break the silence from the bottom. And I think this is why culture and leadership is so important. The bigger Um, the organisation, the the more crucial these leaders are in signifying that change. I think it is harder for a movement to start organically when you're that big. And I think that's yeah. where the, the role of leadership and commitment really comes into place. So the Time to Change pledge that Hollyoaks have signed, for example. Um, so this, this pledge is such a simple pledge. It's, it's, it's a pledge that you will create a culture where you have a conversation about mental health. And that can be as simple as you know, encouraging people to come along to an event like this during Mental Health Awareness Week. Mm. Um, or it could be um, making sure that you catch up with your boss more regularly to talk about other things so you create trust and a relationship where you can disclose if something's not going right for you. So just this idea of starting off with a conversation is where you should start. Obviously, leadership comes into it afterwards. This is something that applies to any industry. TV clearly has its own unique pr- pressures, but... You know, so does being a paramedic, so does working in the construction industry. And those uh, employers, of course, accept their responsibility to kind of protect their staff. Um, 
to, to kind of like not to kind of go off to a completely different business area, but um, I think construction's an interesting example because you've got people who are working away from home, you've got people who are isolated, they might not be able to see their GP, they might not be able to see their families, so they're cut off from support structures, more male environments. We know that men find it harder to talk about their feelings than women. And at the same time, we still expect those employers to say, OK, well, what is it about this, about this situation that we can address? OK, well, why don't we you know, introduce an employee assistance programme, which is you know, a confidential phone line where you can talk with a trained therapist about mm. your problem? Why don't we think about how we can have like tiers where you can talk to, the, talk to someone in confidence about your problem who can help you talk to your boss if that's the next step. So it's all about finding solutions that are appropriate to your workplace, but absolutely it has to start with those conversations being a safe conversation mm -hmm. and not feeling that you're risking yourself or risking your career by having it. And that has to be led from the top. <laughs> I, think yeah. that I think that's really important important point about appropriate measures for different and there's a hell of a lot of variety within television I mean Hollyoaks sounds amazing I want to work in Hollyoaks um, you won't have me but um, you know if we're talking about news production it's a very different rhythm and mm -hmm. you're working to very tight deadlines the 10 o'clock news has to go out at 10 o'clock and you know, so I think that needs a different set of considerations about it I think there are some reality formats that need to, you know I know someone who works the production assistant on Big Brother, for Channel 5, not Channel 4. Um, you know, and I can only begin to imagine how intense a Big Brother production schedule mm -hmm. is, and she came off that, and she had a major mental health episode and was in the hospital for five weeks off the back of it. Directly and connected with the, the stresses of the show? Essentially, yes, because mm. she was so caught up in that production schedule, and she knew she couldn't let anyone else on the team down. So her strong sense was, I've got to hold it together just mm. to the end of shooting, and then it'll collapse. Or I know somebody who works on um, SES Who Dares Wins, which I have to confess I've never watched, but apparently that's a bit at the end where it all gets quite intense. Mm -hmm. She was kind of awake for 48 hours. Um, and she found, and I think she'd had a young baby at the time as well. Somebody might say, I mean, I'm being devil's advocate, why would somebody who is feeling vulnerable physically or mentally go on who dares wins? I mean, I wouldn't go near it. I haven't, I've never even done the single press-up as instructor, <laughs> so I would never go near it. But obviously, do you feel that there was a, a, a negligence of care to her? What, what's your well, I, I think challenge she, there? I think she took... She did a lot of work on that programme. Yeah. She took the job because she was getting back into work. You know, it yeah. was the job that was being offered to Fair her, enough. and as we okay. all do when you're freelance, you don't say no to and jobs you want, come up. Yes, you want to answer um, the call, don't you? Yeah. So I'm, sound like a bit of a Debbie Downer now, I know, but it's not. I'm just saying I think there are different challenges in different places well, is, and yeah. we need a sort of fairly nuanced thought about how you, you know, working in news, there are news editors who see footage that the rest of us mm. don't see. That's their job. How do you support yeah, them to balance. cope with some of that mm. trauma that happens? I mean, so I'm, I'm just thinking of I think my... there's lots of situations beyond... What my um, editor in Australia, I'm just imagining the look on his face if I'd said I'm just going to the yoga room. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I think we have some time just for some quick questions from the floor. We're hopefully not overrunning yet, I'll be told. Um, oh, here we are. Look, there is a microphone doing the rounds, so do shout. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Daly. Um, I've actually come all the way down from Scotland oh. on the request of many TV folk from up there. Um, I work in TV, I'm an assistant producer. Uh, three years ago, I had my own episodes and uh, had suicide or whatever. And, uh, no, didn't have a suicide, nearly had a suicide. Um, but uh, the reason why I'm here is I actually ended up creating, because after nobody would work with me afterwards, I started creating my own online content and ended up setting my own charity called Mental Health. And I now work with Johnny Benjamin and Time to Change and we do lots of great stuff. And I've made my way back into television, doing a peeing again. Um, there's a company I'm working with at the moment, uh, IWC, who uh, work on locations over the last couple of years. We've been working on ways to allow me to work in the industry in a helpful, safe way. We have found ways that are, so shoots for me are not going to be a great thing. They're going to be stressful, they're going to be late nights, and they're bound to probably kind of set me off. So I now work with a researcher each time who's about to make a step up to an AP. And we found a solution where I'm doing beneficial for the company, whilst also getting to continue my passion, which is making TV. Um, the reason why I mention all this is, I was asked to come down today because a bunch of people emailed me about this saying, oh my God, David, you have to come down there and talk about what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. I now do a seminar 
on TV and with mental health. I'm strangely nervous about this because TV is scary. I can talk about this in front of hundreds of people, thousands of people at the South Bank Centre, but within my own industry, it's still it's terrifying. <laughs> um, I had a survey done about the TV, mental health and television production. Mm -hmm. I did it a couple months ago. We had a ridiculous amount of feedback. Uh, so I'd love to chat to you a little bit more further about it. That's but good. basically, just to kind of give you a few highlights, um, we found that of all the people in particular who actually kind of joined in, 50% had a diagnosed mental health condition. So 50, sorry, 5-0. Five 5-0. Zero. Five zero. Goodness. But 72% um, of them had never told anyone in a position above them. That's what you said. 94% um, yeah. had never received any form of mental health awareness or even training, personnel training, regardless of mental health in the mm -hmm. industry. And 86% believe that telling an employer any of this will jeopardise their chances. Yep. I'm trying to change that, but at the same time, they also know that there's only one company who will currently work with me. But um, I think there's definitely changes being made, and I definitely think there are solutions that can actually work. It's about making, as you said, a nuanced, a nuanced response to how we treat people. I'm lucky now that there's a company who's like, right, we can use this guy with his great experience and what he's done before to train up people. And by that, we can mean that he doesn't have to go on a suit, but he can supervise and mentor someone. And I think it's really important that us in kind of the TV industry kind of look to those ways to kind of make this work better because at uh, the end of the day, I'm damn good at what I do. I set up a survey instead of a charity whilst going through my mental health crisis because TV wouldn't employ me. Um, and I think it would be a shame if we don't kind of utilise all those people we have. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the final point I want to say was, and this is a question, is there not a way for us as an industry to try and we have so many great policies now, like when a, a great organisation like Channel 4 commissions a programme, they ask for, you know, can you have a footprint number, can you, can you reach these targets? It's up to the production, the actual companies to kind of ask, when they commission shows, to kind of say, and can you show us your commitment to your staff and your freelancers? Is that a way to kind of maybe affect the change with all of us in the middle, in the, uh, in the Indies that are really kind of struggling? Because we don't have the protection of the larger companies, and maybe the larger companies could make that step to influence that change. Is that something you think would work? There we go. Sorry I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah. really straightforward. Who's, who's going to say no? We don't care about our employees <laughs> enough to sign it. Well, I, I love that idea. I think it's perfect. I think it's what the industry needs, because mm. I think people going to work for production companies and broadcasters want to know that there are certain principles that they're signed up to. And I think on the, in large part, that is what the broadcasters and the production companies want as well. But you need to... Yeah, I mean, if there were a, a kite mark of some sort that said, yes, this is, we sign up to certain principles about how we look after and care for the people that work with us. I think it's quite challenging for broadcasters because they've got quite long supply chains when they're commissioning from indies who are subcontracting to do freelancers down the end. Quite frankly, they often don't know what's going on at the end of that supply chain. So how do we put some visibility in across that supply chain that gives everyone the confidence and the people at the end of that supply chain therefore feel more empowered and, and protected. But I'd love to work with you on um, mental health stuff as well. So there you go. What's worth you coming? <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Oh, quite a few. All right, let's go start here at the end. Gentlemen, thank you. Yep, hello. Hi, uh, um, my name's Tim. Uh, one of the questions I had for the panel uh, was in regard to what are the main root causes for mental health issues? So mm -hmm. is it, I mean, I'm thinking about the Back to um, Eyes Half Shut report that was done back in 2017, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is one of the main causes of mental health crises um, to do with overwork. Uh, right. Just putting it out there. Um, what, what are, what are yeah. the stresses? What, what are the things that cause it? Combination. Um, financial is a, is a huge one. Um, it's, uh, and it is financial uh, relationships, um, whatever that means to you. Uh, it's kind of a melting pot, really, of, of, of what I say day to day, but that, those are the ones that certainly come through from, from the work that I do. Um, and I know I, I sort of keep going on about it, but it is recognising at the grassroots low mood, stress and worries. And it's what that means to you. Everyone has their own... This is, I think this is why mental health is, is, has taken such a long time for everyone to grasp, because it is so unique, it is so bespoke. It is not one size fits all. Um, every form of therapy will be different, even if it's the same therapist. My brother and I had, uh, had the same therapist for a time. For me, he was incredible. My brother? 
couldn't work out what the big fuss was, didn't work for him. Um, and that just goes to show everyone is very unique and very different. So I think the problem is there is no one answer to that excellent question. It's knowing yourself. It's knowing your triggers, knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And crucially, never measuring yourself against anybody else. If your colleague can work four hours and drink 15 pints and then still pull out a stellar performance the next day, good for them. I had to learn very quickly. I'm crap at after work drinks. I don't go other than one and even then it's a Coke because I can't survive and I can't cope on less than eight hours sleep. Um, and obviously when you're in the middle of a busy filming schedule, you know, that's really important. I'm probably a massive boring person. But you know what? I've it's taken me to hit rock bottom to know. I don't really care because it's what works for me and I will get up in the morning I won't feel anxious because I haven't got a hangover and I'm sleep deprived so it's knowing you and what your triggers are that I think is the key there we go I think at a, sorry can I just yep. join in I think the, at a pan industry level we don't know is the short answer and that's the mm. question we're trying to answer we're trying to answer what is going on and what's behind it I mean there's a whole load of bunch of stuff you can hypothesize about I think all the stuff that's been talked about today is right but we don't we can't really say is there something complicated to do with power structures? Is it working practices? Is it late nights? Is it working away from home? Is it deadlines? Is it predisposition to people? I mean, we don't know. And that's what we're trying to, to get to the bottom of with the survey that we're doing this year. It's really interesting. Um, right, where should we go next? Let's try and get them all. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Beck. I'm a documentary producer. Um, most of the time, if I'm in a yoga studio, it's because I'm taking a contributor in there and filming them. There is not a chance I would get to go and do that on a programme and we're out on shoots all the time. Um, and probably the biggest stress for us in our job is handing those people over, the contributors that we filmed. A lot of what we do is really sensitive access and we're really holding their hand the whole way through it. And then we pop them on the telly, we tell them, turn off your Facebook for a couple of weeks and you'll be fine. Um, and then obviously they're not fine or we see things like what's happening in the news this week. Um, and I guess there's, you want the... The producers to be supported, but we're all freelancers and we can't look after them afterwards. Um, but how do we do that? How do we look after contributors that we are chucking into the lion's den of television in a, in a way where we want to be able to help them through before, after, and during? There we go. Big question again. They're all big questions. Mm. Who would like to offer their solution to this lady's I guess, Anna, you're, you're, you're in the cold face. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just trying to... I'm, I'm, How do you look know, after your contributors? How do you best protect them? Well, this is where it's interesting, because this is where, on the flip side, now, um, as, uh, as a psychotherapist, I very much work on that side, and I've worked on Big Brother, I've worked on Love Island behind the scenes, uh, albeit very briefly, um, now uh, as a Celebs Go Dating host. Um, it's a really interesting combination, because we have... I'd say the absolute classic scenario there. There's the entertainment telly. We need that meat and that storyline out of that person on camera. You know, we want to see that raw emotion. And yet on the flip side, there I am as a professional, and, I need to, and very much their, their mental health is absolutely paramount. The last series, a classic example, I think someone who's very, very known for her mental health, Carrie Katona, we had on the show. Um, and I think that was a, a great example of managing someone that very publicly has uh, bipolar or has mental health um, issues on how we still create that entertaining television programme, which is a very tongue-in-cheek show, yet also protecting her and making sure that she was well, as all of the contestants um, uh, throughout that. So... I flip from both sides. I am talent, so I have my own line of, uh, you know, someone that I, uh, in fact, seeing tomorrow, um, who I report into, who looks after me, you know, the show psychologists. Um, I think it's a great point, as you say, when you're the producers of the show, you're on to the next gig. I mean, you, you've lined your next gig up two weeks before you've wrapped. Um, you're not, you know, you shouldn't, and that's where we have to be careful, and I don't know what the answer is yet, if I'm honest with you, because if you're on another show and you've got a contributor ringing you four weeks post it saying, I'm having a bit of a breakdown and you're already you know balls deep in another show you're going to be affecting your own mental health by having to then cope with all of that and I've spoken with many of, of the execs on, on the shows I've worked in who are having to manage the mental health of contributors who are known for being very fragile they're on the front pages of the tabloids and I always check in with my execs and say but how are you you know how are you feeling 
um, because you're having to shoulder this. I think this does need to come from a higher level, and I do think there are, I know that there have been things that have been more put in place. There does need to be before, middle, and after care available at all times. Um, so let's go dating. I'm just going to take that show because I'm working on it at the moment. That is very much available. Um, but I think it is a two prong attack where contributors should. It's very difficult because as a therapist, you can't force people into therapy and you shouldn't force people into therapy. However, I think it should be a combination of an agreement between contributor and production company, channel, or whoever, that this is a care plan in place. And I think there should be markers along the line for a considerable amount of time or it should be available. Almost like you would if you had gone through therapy and you start to wean off your therapist, you start to go monthly and then it's um, once every two months, then it's, you know, um, every six months. Perhaps that check-in procedure needs to be dealt with by HR or I'm not quite sure who, but some check-in facility and then also a kind of crisis line therapist or someone that is on hand for a contributor to have access to. But I think contributors need to be made aware of how important it is to access that help, not just go, yeah, 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 I'm going to go to all the parties and rinse all my PAs and earn loads of money and not actually bother about it, but actually the importance of when the crashes happen, because they do happen for all of us, we're all in and out of work, it's constantly doing that, as you pointed out, Alex. Um, it's knowing, don't ignore those warning signs, this is how important, I think it needs to be a joint prong attack and there shouldn't be blame on either side it should all be collaborative plus there's the unwritten rule as well which is crazy makes good telly and so you get a bunch you only need one cynical ratings right. seeking producer and that a lot of that can go out of the window because yeah. of the you imagine the temptation you yeah. would need a little bit more of that well i think i think anna's right though as program makers who are making this content we have a responsibility for everybody that participates mm. in our program not just through the process, but beyond. And that may rise above the freelance team that worked on the programme, and that's a conversation that starts earlier. You're absolutely right. There should be a care package or some sort of a procedure in place to run for a certain number of weeks afterwards. And even beyond that, you should have the relationship with that contributor. If you've expected them to give that much of themselves, there should be someone that they can speak to and that they have a relationship with where they're able to share that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that does happen because, as Beck says, it, the yeah. team are off. There we go. They've forgotten. A few calls to arms tonight. Right, where's the microphone? There we go. This gentleman here with the beard. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Keith Weinstein. Uh, no relation. I've been working on Times Change. I just want to say thank you to Anna for uh, acknowledging Prince Harry and Prince William's sort of contribution in putting the spotlight onto mental health. However, I would also like to acknowledge people like David Shields, for example, and the thousands of ordinary people who have raised their heads above parapets and who bravely speak out day after day after day. There are Time to Change champions. They're right across um, England. And um, as part of this Time to Change campaign, I'd, I'd like to suggest two things for um, people working in the media, TV, to think about. One of which is a campaign called In Your Corner, which is a, a campaign that we, we do where we encourage people to support their friends and relatives um, by just being there and actually being there as a, in the corner, as it were. It's primarily sort of for members, it's also applicable to women too, to sort of be there because uh, I'm not a mental health expert even though I've worked at Mind and Time to Change for over a decade, um, but I have my own lived experience and just being there, being an ear, listening is incredibly important. And something that I've been adopting into my, my own personal life, which has now become part of the campaign, is that we, we ask twice. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you sort of say, oh, hi, how are you? And somebody says, oh, I'm fine. And then usually you just say, oh, great, okay, and then you walk away. Well, actually, um, we have an Ask Twice campaign, which is about, oh, how are you? And oh, in fact, really, are you? Because I think being able to sort of explore and just open up and be willing for the other person to know that you're willing to sort of listen. And I know that the, you know, the media industry, people are concerned about careers, and I've heard all this stuff about freelancing. Of course, it's, it's really important. But unless we start sort of being listening ears, actually standing up for people, and just being there to help, then we're never going to change attitudes in society. We're never going to tackle the stigma and discrimination, which really, I think, is at the bottom line of everything that we've been talking about tonight. It's the fear, it's prejudice. It's about people thinking that if somebody has a mental health uh, illness, that somehow they're weak. And actually, all of the people who I know who have mental health problems are survivors and they're living with mental health 
despite mental health issues they're living and they're producing, um, do all sorts of wonderful things. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. And uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have two questions for the panel. One is. Um, where does this sit, um, either um, globally or within your own spaces, mm -hmm. within the disability conversation okay. and within the bigger diversity conversation? Because my, within my background, mental health has always been uh, part of the long-term impairment and condition conversation and at least sits within disability. So that would be interesting in terms of the work that's going on in television. Mm -hmm. And what, where have you, uh, or have people, engaged um, beyond um, themselves in terms of who you're working with and, um, and, and sort of a bit of knowing the history of what you've gone mm. before. And the second question is, where do you think, or do you think, bullying and harassment in the workplace um, fits into the conversation about mental ill health, mental health, and um, understanding of uh, long-term mental health and conditions in effect? Okay, so, um, yeah. look, Brian, you're nodding your head. Well, um... First of all, um, I was going to raise the point about bullying myself a moment ago, because I think that goes back to all these fantastic uh, tactics and schemes that are happening and very worthwhile. Just it boils down to just be nice as well. <laughs> and I think it's um, having a cup of tea and having and going deeper than, yeah, I'm fine, thanks, and then on to the next one, that ruthless competition that defines so much of the TV industry, where people are keeping hold of their job with their fingernails breeds that that bullying uh, environment which can have a terrible impact on people's mental health so I think that's absolutely uh, valid that you're looking out for one means you're looking out for the other um, and in terms of our um, Hollyoaks and Lyme and our disability um, commitment um, I mean that goes on screen as well as off um, and that goes for our diversity as well, because um, it goes back to my childhood as well. I think it's really important that everyone can grow up seeing themselves on the telly. Um, so I'm proud that Hollyoaks um, is getting there in giving our audience themselves reflected back. And hopefully with the, with the recognition and the awards that are coming your way, other people will realise the benefit of that. I mean, I know that it's, it's a big topic, so I'm sorry we haven't got time to... Sorry, I'm not going to jump in. But we've, we've I'm not, I, well, just, again, I'm going to give this sort of short, annoying answer, which is I don't think we really know. I think the intersection of mental health with diversity, um, characteristics and disability, I just think we don't really know. And I think that's what we want to begin to understand much better than we do today, how, how those factors intersect. So I think that's a really useful thing for us to feed into the world that we're planning this year. Right, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Oh, good, there's a big hand over there. All right, here we go. Sorry. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Sally. My uh, background is that I've been working in uh, media TV companies for a number of years in HR, uh, which feels like a bit of a dirty word sometimes. Um, and actually, my experience was that I sometimes uh, felt very conflicted by working in HR teams in TV companies because I felt that um, they didn't display the values that uh, maybe the company was saying were to be displayed. And it was very difficult to be on both sides of that when really you felt that you should be helping people. And it really came down to, on the production, we need to uh, film this, we need to get the production finished, uh, we've got long days, we can't support mothers who uh, need to be able to breastfeed, etc, etc. Uh, in the end, I left and went self-employed and set up Limelight HR to work with TV companies because I'd rather do it in a way that I believe is right and fair and supportive rather than becoming part of a big machine in a big company where you lose all of those values. What you said, Brian, about uh, kindness integrity really... Um, uh, resonated with me I think it's so important and I, I can't believe that in this day and age that's not how we run businesses and the fact that you're able to point out the commercial uh, point of doing that that you can actually as a business do better by supporting people and being kind and fair and um, I think it's an opportunity for small creative businesses to actually uh, hopefully take on some uh, staff that maybe aren't appreciated elsewhere and hopefully in the end by uh,
being recognised for setting themselves up as that as Lime Pictures doing fantastic things, uh, that actually the, the best people will want to work with those businesses because ultimately people want to be treat well, treated well and they want to be valued. So the big corporations should miss out if they don't do that themselves because why shouldn't somebody be treated well at work? Um, I just think it's fantastic what you've all shared today, so thank you. And if there's anything I can do to help uh, Alex or anybody, uh, I'm happy to get involved. Great thank stuff. Um, tell you what, why don't, um, I don't know how much time we've got, but um, I think the panel will probably be hovering for the next few minutes. So for the questions that haven't had a chance, perhaps you would grab your... Am I okay just pimping you out like this? Um, because I'm, I'm aware that we're running out of time, but it's, oh, there's obviously a need and an interest, which is great. So please, in the meantime, thank, join me in thanking everyone for sharing this. Thank you.